There's only one person in the entire Bible that God calls his friend, and his name is Abraham. And I believe there's a reason that this man is the only one that has that explicit title. But what does it even mean to be a friend of God? In John chapter 15, Jesus seems to be alluding to Abraham when he calls his disciples his friends. And there's a reason Jesus does this. See, Abraham gives us a template for how to walk in friendship with God. And every day, God is inviting us into deeper relationship to experience the more he has for us. We have way more access than we understand. So let's jump into the scriptures to examine six essential keys to living as a friend of God. I don't think we really understand what it means to be a friend of God. It's so much better than we think. We focus so much on the childlike aspect, the the relationship between God and us as father and child, and that is primary. I think that's really important. But there's also this friendship dimension that doesn't really get mentioned or, or talked about. And it does overlap with the, the, the relationship we have with God as father and child. But I don't think we know really what it means that God has chosen to befriend us. That God has chosen to extend to us the hand of friendship and invite us into his family as beloved children. And I, I know this is quite the statement, but so much of our frustration in life and our, our depression, our anxiety, our discouragement, our insecurity, our issues, whatever it is, can often be traced back to, not always, but often it can be traced back to the fact that we don't really know what it means to live as friends of God. We're living in our own strength. We're living by our own understanding. We're making decisions without God's guidance. We're fighting battles without His power. We're dealing with issues or trying to deal with issues in our own limited wisdom and resources and, and connections. But if we just partner with God in what He's doing in the, in the earth and, and what He's doing in our life, it'll be so much better for us. See, God wants to lift the burden off of your life, not completely where there's no complication and there's no discomfort and there's no trouble and there's no difficulty, but so much of the, the extra pressure we feel in life and the burden comes from our own decision to not partner with God in what he's doing, to not ask God to come into what, what it is that we're dealing with. And we try and fight these things and deal with them in our own strength. And we don't need to manufacture resources or connections or come up with the, bru- the blueprint for our life. If we simply partner with God, he'll show us all these things. And so to be a friend of God means we actually have access. We have care. We have guidance. We have provision. We have wisdom. We have security. We have love. We have purpose. We have empowerment. We have joy and peace and satisfaction. And God gives us everything that we need to live a life of godliness. The only character in the entire Bible that is called explicitly a friend of God is Abraham. That doesn't mean there's never another character that models friendship with God or has a friendship with God. David was a man after God's own heart. Moses was the most humble man on the earth. Job was, you know, a righteous man in the sight of God. You have Daniel who feared the Lord. So you have all these examples of of people who really obeyed and loved and feared God, but there's one character in the entire Bible and I think it's on purpose. I, I, not I think, I know that the way God refers to Abraham as his friend is intentional. It's supposed to carry an incredible weight. But before we get to that, look at what Jesus says in John 15. I just want us to be thinking about this as we jump to Abraham and look at what it means to be a friend of God. In John 15, in the upper room, Jesus is giving his kind of last few words, final message to his disciples before his death, burial, and resurrection. And he says in verse 12, This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you, to the degree that I have loved you, in the likeness that I have loved you. With Jesus' love being the model, greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. What is the greatest possible way to demonstrate love for someone? What is the highest level of love? To lay down your life for your friends. Now Jesus is primarily speaking of himself as the one laying down his life, like John 10 tells us. He says, you are my friends if you do what I command you. And it seems as though, at first, I don't think this is what's actually going on, but it sounds as though, oh, I have to do what he commands me in order to become his friend, or in order to stay his friend, or or in order to be his friend. I think Jesus has already laid down in John 6, up to this point, we already know that Jesus says, this is the work of God, that you believe in the one and only Son whom he has sent. So the true work of God, the way to partner with God, the way to come under 
you know, what it is that God is doing in the earth and to be a part of that is by believing in the Son first. And then you become a friend of God. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant doesn't know what his master is doing. And here's kind of the tension here for us. Army servants, bond servants of God, willingly laying down our life and and serving the Almighty King and, and letting Him direct my life and obeying His will and commands. Isn't it true that we're servants of God? So why does Jesus say, no longer do I call you servants? Is a servant mentality no longer appropriate for those who are in Christ? I don't think that's what Jesus is saying, but He's highlighting a specific element of service and servanthood. And what it would mean to be a bondservant. He says a servant does not know what his master is doing. So this is not just a universal objective statement about who we are in relationship to God. We're not servants. We don't function as servants. All throughout the scriptures that would be disproven very quickly. Instead, we have Jesus highlighting a specific dimension of service. Usually a servant, a bondservant, does not know what his master is doing. And we'll get to that. But he says, I've called you friends in this context for Jesus to call, for Jesus to call them friends, for them to be friends of Jesus means he lays down his life for them. He actually reveals all that I've heard from the father I've made known to you. He reveals the mysteries of God that were once hidden in ages past. And he says, you did not choose me. Friendship is a choice, right? We're not friends with everyone. We don't just accept everyone as friends. You decide, you choose, who is it that I'm going to trust and let in my inner circle or whatever circle as a friend? You choose that. He says, I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. So friendship has a purpose here. And that your fruit should abide so that, here's the benefits of friendship for the disciples. Whatever you ask the Father in my name, not just that you'll be able to bear fruit, not just that you're appointed and chosen for a purpose. Not, that, not just that you have the mysteries of God revealed to you. Not just that Jesus lays down his life for you. But whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. These things I command you so that you will love one another. I want this passage of scripture to be on your mind as we're reading about Abraham. There are a few places in the Old Testament where Abraham is referred to as a friend of God. I only found three of them. Well, the Bible, rather. There's one in the New Testament, and there's twice in the Old Testament. If I'm mistaken, and I didn't study correctly, and I missed something, please let me know. But the only two places in the Old Testament where Abraham is called a friend of God is in Second Chronicles chapter 20. And I want us to be thinking about the context of friendship. In other words, we want to be asking, what does it mean that God has chosen to make Abraham his friend? What are the benefits of that friendship? What's the context of that friendship? What does it mean for Abraham to have the friend, uh, the, the, the opportunity to be a friend of God? 2 Chronicles 20 verse 7 says, Speaking to God, after this the Moabites, this is Jehoshaphat's prayer to God. Judah assembled to seek help from the Lord. Jehoshaphat stood and said, God, You rule the kingdoms of the world in your hand or power and might. No one can withstand you. Did you, our God, did you not drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel? Didn't you do that? Didn't you give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, that being Israel, your friend? Isn't it interesting That the prayer of Jehoshaphat, referring to Abraham as friend, involves God giving Abraham's descendants land. That God promised to Abraham. So God makes a specific promise to Abraham and his descendants benefit from that promise. What you'll see throughout the Old Testament very often is that God remembers his covenant. God remembers the fathers of Israel. God remembers the patriarch. And what God does is he treats Israel, the nation, not according to what they deserve all the time, but according to the promise that he made to their fathers. So for God to make Abraham his friend means that Abraham is going to be a benefit to and bless not just his own descendants in them getting the land and being blessed and having a name, but also in Abraham being a conduit to the rest of the world through which blessing would flow. So in this context, for Abraham to be a friend of God means God gives 
a gift to his descendants. God blesses his descendants because of his friendship with Abraham. Isaiah chapter 41, verse 7 and 8. It says, everyone helps his neighbor and says to his brother, be strong, and the craftsman strengthens the goldsmith, he who smooths with the hammer, him who strikes with the anvil, saying of the soldering, it is good, and they strengthen it with nails so that it cannot be moved. But you, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, thus says the Lord, the offspring of Abraham, my friend, you who I took, From the ends of the earth and called from its farthest corner saying to you, you are my servant. Sounds like John 15, right? You are my servant. I have what? Chosen you. I have not cast you off. Fear not. I am with you. What does Jesus say in Matthew 28 to his disciples? I am with you to the end of the age. Be not dismayed. I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And the question becomes why? Why? Because they deserve it? Because they're worthy? Because they're living obedient and faithful to the covenant? No. Because of the promise God made to Abraham, their father. Because Abraham was a friend of God. Abraham was chosen. So therefore, by their proximity and descent from Abraham being his descendants, they also get the benefits of this promise that God made to Abraham. Some of the benefits, not all of them. That's where we get into physical versus spiritual. But the idea of Israel being chosen, being redeemed, taken, blessed, made a servant, God is with them, God upholds them. It's all because, in this context of who Abraham was to God as a friend. So the first time we see God refer to Abraham as friend through Jehoshaphat is God giving his descendants the land. In this context, God is choosing Abraham and his descendants to do good to them. So we have God giving, we have God choosing, and you should be thinking, that sounds like John 15 where Jesus is giving or revealing the mysteries of God that were hidden in ages past, giving them the blessing and benefits of the covenant he's establishing. He's choosing those to be his friend. And now we'll see the last place that Jesus, or rather Abraham, is referred to as a friend of God. In the entire Bible, I could find nothing else. If, if I'm mistaken, please do correct me so I can learn. But in James chapter 2, In the context of Abraham doing what God said to do and revealing his faith and his faith being completed in the sense that it was benefiting someone else, Abraham believes God, his faith is active, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Is Genesis chapter 15. When God calls Abraham out, says, look at the stars, that's how many your children are going to be. Abraham goes, dang. He believes God and God goes, whoo. He renders that to Abraham as righteousness, counts it to Abraham as righteousness, and he's called a friend of God. Now, I think that and seems to, that could be mistaken grammatically, but the and seems to kind of be like a consequently, because Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness, consequently, he's called a friend of God. What God chooses to call Abraham is connected to Abraham standing before God. I don't think it's possible to be a friend of God, yet be unrighteous or be without righteousness. You have to have right standing with God to be his friend. And I think Abraham has that when he believes. So in the context here, for Abraham to be a friend of God means Abraham listens, trusts, does what he says, and God makes him righteous through his faith. Not necessarily his action and what he does, That's just evidence of the already present inward faith that God honors. God makes him righteous because he believes. And then you'll see that Abraham does and and works flow from that and obedience. But Abraham just believed, took God at his word, trusted what he said. Belief is not agreeing with the facts merely. That's the starting place. The true faith, rather there is a distinction between faith and belief. So let me back that up. Faith is not just believing 
in terms of agreeing with the facts. Faith is trusting in, leaning on, and I guess committing yourself to what you agree is true that God says, which is what faith is, uh, believing loyalty in Jesus, trusting in Jesus, leaning on Jesus, looking to him, all these different ways that he refers to faith. So three times Abraham is referred to as friend of God. First time, God giving. Second time, God choosing. Third time, God making righteous. And Abraham is doing what it is that God called him to do. Which started with simply taking him at his word and being made righteous. And then we have later on, he lays down Isaac on the, on the altar on Mount Moriah. But that was after he was already deemed righteous. That is not the reason he's deemed righteous. So let's not, inter- let's not I guess, get the order of salvation out of order. The reason I start there with Abraham is because we're going to go to John 15 now. And I want you to remember, what is it that Jesus, in the context here in the upper room, speaking to his friends, there's a a shift happening here. He's going, you have been servants up to this point, but I've called you friends now because of what I'm choosing to do. I've made known to you all these things. No longer are you in the dark. No longer do you not know what the Father is doing. No longer do you not know God's agenda and plan and will and overall, you know, general blueprint for what he's doing throughout human history. I've made these things known to you. So I just want to read these things and I want to be thinking about Abraham because I really do believe that Jesus obviously knows the Old Testament, but I think there is even an allusion to the friendship Abraham had with God here in John 15. Let's just think about this, okay? Think about all the moments God showed, proved that Abraham truly was his friend. Verse 13, Jesus says, Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. What did God do because of the covenant he made with Abraham, his friend? Well, when Israel was in Egypt, enslaved in captivity, God heard their cry, remembered his covenant, which means chose to act now, and remembered that covenant that he made with Abraham, his friend, and God personally comes down and begins doing signs and wonders, breaks Israel free, destroys the Egyptian armies at the Red Sea, and rescues them. Did God lay down his life there? Not, not particularly, I wouldn't say that, not yet until Jesus comes. But what God does there is he gets involved with the descendants of Abraham, rescues them because of his friendship with Abraham. Verse 14, you are my friends if you do what I command you. Abraham is called a friend of God because he believed God in Genesis 15. We're also going to see that that friendship evolves and grows, where Abraham actually does what God calls him to do, even if it's incredibly confusing and difficult and frustrating and discombobulating and sacrificial. Abraham lays down Isaac, his true first and only son, on the altar, on Mount Moriah, believing that God could even raise him from the dead, holds the knife out, and God goes, that is a man who believes me. And he goes, Abraham, don't. Don't kill him. So we see that Abraham, as a friend of God, does what God commands him, just like Jesus says to his disciples here. Verse 15, No longer do I call you servants, For the servant does not know what his master is doing. I've called you friends. And here's the distinction in this context between friend and servant. Don't get confused. Some people take this verse and now Jesus is my homeboy. Jesus is my G. Jesus is just the guy that co-signs everything I already decided to do because he's my friend and he gives me everything I want. Jesus is king of the universe. And he is worthy of your servants, your service, your loyalty and allegiance, and your obedience. But he is also, he has decided to make you his friend. In this context, the distinction between friend and servant is Jesus reveals what the Father, what he's heard from the Father. Whereas, like Hebrews opens up in chapter 1, Long ago at many times, our fathers through the prophets heard God speak, but now 
He's given us his son, the ultimate, eternal, perfect word personified to us. So there's a contrast between Jesus and the Old Testament revelation of God through the prophets, through the law, through whatever, David and, and, and the writings. There's a big difference. Jesus is better. Jesus is the fulfillment. Jesus is the substance and the realization and what was foreshadowed. So what we have in verse 15 is just like Abraham, Jesus is telling his friends the mysteries of God that were once hidden in ages past that I've heard, that I've seen, I'm revealing that to you. You don't trust everyone with secrets, right? So Jesus is very selective, very particular about who it is that he's going to reveal certain truths to at certain times, which is why he'll say very often throughout his ministry, don't tell anyone what I've done for you. Don't tell anyone what you've seen. Don't tell anyone about the resurrection and what's going to happen. And the apostles are like, what? We don't even get what you're talking about. Where are we? What's happening? In verse 15, we see this with Abraham. If you recall in Genesis chapter, I want to say 18. I could be wrong. I am correct. In Genesis 18, the Lord appears to Abram. God has come down because he's heard the cry against Sodom and Gomorrah, and he's coming to render judgment and actually give justice that, that the, the, the blood that's been shed has been crying out for. But before he does, he comes to Abram. And look at what God says to himself in this odd interaction. The men set out from there, and they looked down towards Sodom. Abraham went with them, and the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? Because Abraham is eventually going to become a great and mighty nation. All the earth shall be blessed by him. I've chosen him. So notice blessing, choosing, this unique relationship he has with Abraham as friend, as the patriarch of the faith that he may command his children right, to do what God has called, to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice. All of those elements in John 15 are present in this text. Obedience, blessing, being chosen, unique relationship with God, the, the, the nations being blessed through the descendants. Then the Lord said, because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great and their sin is very grave, I'm going to go down and essentially look at this outcry. And the men turn from there and Abraham draws near and goes, I heard what you're going to do. Are, are you going to sweep away the wicked, the righteous with the wicked? Let, let's just say there's 50 righteous people in the city, God. Will you spare the city for 50 righteous? God goes, sure, sure. And Abraham goes, I am but dust. How about 45? God goes, for 45, I won't destroy the city. Okay, this is a big jump, and I know I'm... Um, how about 30? How about 20? For the sake of 20, I won't. Eventually, Abraham whittles God down to 10. Abraham, look, the reason Abraham's concerned is because his nephew, Lot, his relative, lives in Sodom and Gomorrah. So if that region gets decimated, there goes Lot. So Abraham is trying to play the role of mediator like Moses, like Daniel, like other characters in Scripture, even like David at times. He's trying to mediate between, essentially, Lot and God. And God actually allows this mediation of sorts, this, this request. Look, God, even if there's ten, like if you find ten righteous, will you destroy the city? God goes, no. What we have here is exactly what we see in John 15. God is choosing to let Abraham know what he's doing in the earth. God is choosing to invite Abraham into his plans and be a part of it. Otherwise, God would not have made this such a, a public display of what he was going to do. He would have been quiet about it. I think God knows how to keep a secret. So the fact that he's talking right in front of Abraham about what he's about to do is an invitation to bring Abraham into that. And Abraham kind of takes the bait and goes, well, so you're telling me you're going to da-da-da? And God goes, fine, 10. What I also see in that 
is that God answers the request of Abraham. Does God actually find 10 righteous in the city? No. Does God end up destroying that region? Yes. Does God spare Lot? Yes. Why? Because of God's friendship with Abraham and because of Lot's relationship to Abraham, God's friend. Also, what we see is that Jesus says the same thing here. In verse 16, whatever you ask the Father in my name, like he'll give it to you when you go and bear fruit. That's Abraham. That's Abraham being able to approach God, just dust, nothing but, you know, dust that comes from the ground and he knows his place and yet, God, I have a request. I would like to petition you. Could you not wipe out Sodom and Gomorrah? God goes, if I find 10, sure. Why Abraham goes... Stops at 10, no idea. Why Abraham doesn't go any lower, no idea. Probably something I've never thought of. But the point here is, look at verse 16, or 15. Just like Jesus is making known the mysteries of God, inviting the disciples into the plan and will of God that he's accomplishing across the earth. He's saying, come and be a part of it. That's John 6. Come and be a part of what God is doing. Come and partner with him. Come and be friends of God by believing in the Son and get to work and do what he's doing instead of working against it. That same invitation is essentially extended to Abraham in Genesis 18. And the whole fruitfulness, like, hey, go be fruitful and let your fruit abide. Well, that's exactly what Abraham is how Abraham is described in Genesis 18 and, and through a, a lot of his story, he's referred to as being the one that will have a bunch of offspring, that will bless the nations. In that sense, he's going to be very fruitful and, be, uh, and multiply and bless the world. And just like Abraham is chosen by God as a friend, Jesus chooses his friends here in verse 16. And verse 17 is the really the, the heart of what Jesus is getting at. Here's the main point. These things I command you, love one another. If you, if you look at verse 12, verse 12 and 17 are the end caps of this section. And in other words, this whole section is sandwiched between go and love one another as I've loved you. Abraham is known for showing love and hospitality to people, primarily to God when he comes to the Oaks of Mamre in Genesis 18. Abraham shows tremendous hospitality. Abraham shows tremendous compassion and love on even the stranger. And, and yes, there are moments where he's kind of a jerk, and he's kind of deceitful, and he's kind of uh, snake-like, right? But at the same time, Abraham very often is known for his love and hospitality. And what's interesting is in Genesis 18, Abraham says, hey, let me come and, and, and let's get some water to wash your feet. When God visits Abraham with the two angels, Abraham goes, I know this presence. Let me, let me wash your feet. What did Jesus just do in John 14 here? He washed the feet of his disciples, his friends, even Judas, who had the legitimate hand of friendship extended to him, but he slapped it away. In John 5, verse 20, Jesus tells us this. It's always so vulnerable as you guys are just watching me drink. For the Father loves the Son and shows Him all that He is doing. Greater works than these will He show Him so that you may marvel. That's exactly what Jesus just said in John 15. But instead of Him being the one the Father is showing things to. The context of Jesus, I guess the uniqueness here of Jesus' relationship to the Father is that the Father is showing things to the Son that no one else is seeing and knowing and hearing. There's that unique revelation and, and sharing of mysteries. Well, John 15, Jesus is inviting the disciples into that. So I want us just to be thinking about, wow, friendship with God displayed by Abraham, Jesus extending that to his apostles. And the apostles, like John 17 is going to say, in Jesus' high priestly prayer, he's going to say, I don't just pray for these, but for all those who will be reached by these whom I'm sending out. Jesus is extending the hand of friendship, not just to the apostles, but through the apostles and the preaching of the gospel to the nations. So let's just think about how these descriptions fit Jesus, because what I think 
is helpful to, to realize is that Jesus is the ultimate friend of God. He's the better Abraham. He's the perfect Abraham. But also, simultaneously, Jesus is the perfect firstborn, only begotten son like Isaac. So it's like Jesus is playing both roles perfectly and being the ultimate son of God and being the ultimate friend of God. And when you read John 15, you realize, whoa, Jesus is, he is the invitation into friendship with God. Because he says in verse 13, greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You know what's cool? God told Abraham, hey, anyone who blesses you, I'll bless. Anyone who curses you, I'll curse. Why? Because of how they would treat Abraham, God's friend. In other words, God took it pretty personally how you would treat his friend Abraham. Hey, if you don't know me, my name is Jason, and I have some free gifts for you on our website at abovereproachministry.com. Maybe you want to learn how to study the Bible. We have free Bible classes just for you. Are you maybe a newer believer? Go ahead and check out our Christianity 101 Foundations course. Maybe you hate videos. Well, we have a podcast, so you can listen to all of our messages on whatever podcast platform you prefer. Maybe you want to join or start a discussion group. Check out our map of all the current armed discussion groups all around the world. And do you maybe live near Greenville, South Carolina? If you do, you should check out our church on Friday nights. Visit movementchurchsc.com for more information. And if you'd like to partner with us financially, you can snag a copy of my book, Fruitful, or head over to the donate page and donate through debit or credit card, PayPal, Cash App, Venmo, Patreon, or even mail a check to P.O. Box 509 Inman, South Carolina. And if you want to make a ministry connection, feel free to reach out to me on our website. All right, I know that was a lot, but I'm done. So let's get back to the video. And if... You're going to be kind to Abraham. Blessing is extended to you on behalf of Abraham. If you're mean to him, well, you ain't getting the kind treatment from God on behalf of Abraham. And Jesus is that. Just like being connected to Abraham had its benefits, being connected to Jesus has more. We benefit from his life and his finished work on the cross. We're rescued because of him. He laid down his life. Abraham didn't lay down his life. Abraham was willing to give up his son's life. Abraham was willing to, but there was no like Abraham, I guess the only instance I can think of is when Abraham went out and rescued Lot. So maybe in that sense, Abraham was willing to lay down his life for his nephew Lot. But I think Jesus is escalating that, if anything, and saying, look, and again, I don't think this connection between Jesus and Abraham is, is is unfounded in the scriptures. John 8, Jesus says, truly I say to you before Abraham was, I am, right? So we'll look at that. But I think Jesus is saying, I'm laying down my life for my friends to be what Abraham couldn't be, to be what Isaac couldn't be. It's like he's combining the Mount Moriah story and then the Abraham, the whole Abraham story in, into himself. And saying what Abraham was to God as friend, what what Isaac was to be as this image of sacrificing the firstborn. He's saying, I am that. And I'm making you friends of God. Verse 14, you are my friends if you do what I command you. Jesus, guess what? Perfectly did what the Father commanded him. Even in the garden scene where he's wrestling with that, I don't want to, but if you want me to, then I want what you want more than I do. Garden of Gethsemane, sweating drops of blood. I'm submitting to your will, Father, even obedient to the point of death on a cross. Jesus never, ever fails or sins. He perfectly does what God's, God commanded him as the ultimate friend of God. Verse 15, Jesus will say, No longer do I call you servants, For the servant doesn't know what his master is doing. And that's exactly what we saw in John 5 when the father reveals to the son what he's doing. Verse 16, you didn't choose me, but I chose you. Jesus is the ultimate chosen one of God. He is the beloved, the chosen, the appointed one and approved by the father. Go to the baptism story. Go to the Mount of Transfiguration. Go to the resurrection God has made it very clear, this is my son that I've chosen to represent humanity and lay down his life and bring sufficient sacrifice and deal with sin and human depravity and death. He's the one that's appointed to be the ruler of the entire cosmos like Daniel saw in his vision. And Jesus says, I appointed you to go and bear fruit so that whatever you ask the Father, he may give to you. I love that in John 17... 
Jesus is going to plead the case of all those who have faith in him. 1 John 2 also speaks to this. Jesus defends his people perfectly. His high priestly prayer is like an extension of Abraham's request in Genesis 18. In other words, what we have in Genesis 18 is essentially Abraham saying, hey, can you like not destroy Sodom and Gomorrah? Because Lot's there. We have Jesus escalate that and amplify it to the point that Jesus is defending all of humanity that takes refuge in him through faith and saying, would you not destroy them because they're mine, they're in me, they're protected, my, my sacrifice covers them. And we have Jesus pleading on our behalf and the Father accepting that and approving of that and honoring that because he's, Jesus is the appointed one by the Father. And then verse 17, he says, these things I command you so that you'll love one another. And Jesus is the ultimate example of love and hospitality. In fact, he ate with the worst of sinners. He received the most prominent sinners of the towns. And in John 14, he washes the feet of his disciples. If that's not hospitality, if that's not grace, if that's not mercy and love, I don't know what is. In fact, in John 8, 53, if you're like, I don't think Jesus is connected to Abraham. In John 8, 53, the crowd say, are you greater than our father Abraham? Who do you think you are? And then verse 58, Jesus says, Before Abraham was, I am. The eternally existent one (laughs) that precedes and outlives Abraham. I'm the first and the last, the one who is the beginning and the end. Like, I I am eternally existent and self-sufficient. I was there. And then he says, like, Abraham, look forward to my day, right? So Jesus is set forth as the greater Abraham, who's the ultimate perfect friend of God. Jesus shows us what it means to be a perfect human in perfect harmony with God. And he brings us into that friendship and relationship with God by his sacrifice. John 14, there's only one way back to the Father. And he invites us not just to be where his Father is and where he is. He invites us to walk as he did, hand in hand with his Father. That's the invitation that's on the table for all of us today. That is what's on the table for all of us is that through the the life, death, burial, resurrection of Jesus, through his sacrifice, I don't know what is on my nose, but through everything he has done, we're invited into friendship with God. If you go back to the garden in Genesis, you have Adam and Eve in this perfect scenario, relationship with God, everything they need, set up, protected, cared for, enabled to be fruitful and multiply, blessed, everything you could want. And they choose to focus on what was restricted from them instead of all that they had access to. And I think that's what we do at times. They, they essentially are the first example of friends of God. That's what God made humanity for. It's not because he was bored and needy and insecure, but because he wanted to lavish his love upon someone and glorify himself in that and that people would be satisfied and his glory would be made known and they'd be fruitful and multiply that image. Absolutely. But we do that a lot. We focus so much on what we don't have access to, on what is restricted from us, and then we we don't forfeit our friendship with God. We just neglect it. We minimize our friendship with God. That's not enough for me. I still want this. I'm still waiting for God to do this. I'm still focusing on the prayer that hasn't been answered instead of the 55 that have been this month. I'm focusing on the one thing God has withheld from me that he hasn't given me yet instead of enjoying and thanking him for the millions of things he has given me. So it's just a matter of perspective. But here, I think what's interesting about John 15 and Abraham and Jesus is there's kind of a template that's given in John 15. There really is. Uh, Abraham gives us a template for what it means to live as a friend of God. And then John 15 is, a, is kind of a neat parallel to that. It complements the Abraham story. So I think in John 15, you're going to see as we read it again, because I want this to really sink in. We're going to keep going back and meditating on this each time. You're going to see a, a really helpful template for what it looks like to function as God's friend, to live as a friend of God. Now, I think when people hear friend of God, They hear what I'm not saying. Well, you're not talking about Jesus as king of the cosmos. You're not talking about him as rightful judge, as giver of life, as destroyer of his enemies. You're not talking about us being children of God. That's great. 
We've talked about that over and over through all kinds of messages. Today, we're not saying friend of God takes precedence over the other aspects of our identity and our relationship to God. We're not saying Jesus being our friend takes precedence over all the other titles and positions he holds. We're saying today we're talking about what it means to be a friend of God, very simply. And there are six things that I think John 15 really lays down for us. You want to live led by the Spirit. You want to live submitted to the leading of God's Holy Spirit. You want to live according to the will of God. You want to live worthy of the gospel. You want to partner with God in what He's doing and have a a productive, efficient, eternally significant life. Number one, receive God's love. According to verse chapter 13, chapter 12, or verse 12 rather, there's a call to love one another. I can't do that, First John says, unless he first loves me. And he has. Romans 5, 8, while we are still sinners, Christ died for us. That's the love God demonstrated. So we have love flowing towards us that we can receive. Verse 13, Jesus has laid down his life for the entire world, John 6 will tell us. And John 10 tells us only the sheep benefit from that. But he's laid down his life. He's demonstrated love. And it's our job to daily receive that love. And I think this idea of receiving God's love is way more profound than we understand. Receiving God's love is not just a one-time deal where I believe in the gospel and trust in Jesus. And we have faith. That's great. You've received it. But daily, I need to be reminded of that love. Daily, God is inviting me into deeper fellowship. Daily, God is inviting me into deeper commitment, deeper loyalty, deeper allegiance, deeper love, deeper obedience, and greater works that he wants to do through me. And those things are the byproduct of letting his love be be your greatest focus. You give weight. I heard a, someone talking about the Hebrew word for honoring parents. I forget who it was. But he's talking about the same Hebrew word is a variation of the word for glory, which is weightiness. So essentially in the Ten Commandments, when it says to, to honor your father and mother, it's to give weight to them. Let them be heavy. Let them be weighty and matter to you, which will result in respect and honor and love, right? I think that's true of us. Let the love of God be weighty in your life. Let it be significant. Let it matter. And you go, well, I don't make it matter. It just matters. But we choose what we're going to focus on. You daily choose what is it that I'm going to give weight to in my mind. What am I going to let rule my thinking today? What am I going to let rule my emotions and my attitudes and my disposition? Am I going to give weight to his love or to my issues? Am I going to focus on the fact that God loves me right here in this moment and he'll never love me more and he's displayed his love in the greatest way possible or am I going to focus on everything that is not right in my life and everything I want to fix and all the things that aren't happening? So daily receive the love of God through what? Through just simply sitting at his feet in prayer and recalling his promises and meditating on scripture and thanking God for all that you know he's already done for you. And then opening the scriptures and saying, Lord, teach me, like deepen my understanding of your love. That has become one of my primary prayers when I pray, when I read the Bible rather, is before I read the Bible, I say, God, all of your word reveals who you are. And at the core of that revelation is a deeper understanding of your love for humanity. You are love even in your justice, even in your judgment, even in everything that I don't know where to put that in my theolo- theological categories, is your love is displayed in the scriptures. So please help me understand your love. Because we only love people and God because he first loved us. So if his love has greater weight in my life, then my life will reflect that. If his love has more of my attention, then my life will reflect that. And I'll have more love to give. I'll be filled with that love. The second thing is this. Obey God's word. Verse 14. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I think there's a dual dimension to this statement. Which is number one. You can't be a friend unless you do the first thing God commands. Which is to believe in his son. And yes, that's a commandment. It's something you obey. You choose to trust in Jesus or not. 
you choose to have faith in Jesus or not. And while to a degree it's a gift, it is also a responsibility. Will I believe or not? Now, once you've done that and you're a friend of God through faith in Jesus, there is the daily call to do what God has commanded in his word, which requires me to what? That requires me to know his word first, or I can't know what it is he's commanded me to do. But notice how receiving his love for me comes before doing what he's told me to. Obedience is the overflow of love. The less love I have for God, the less motivation and willpower and desire I have to obey when the flesh is really strong. It's like the love of God towards me is what fuels my obedience. Do what Christ commands by letting him fill you with his love daily, by letting him remind you of what he's done for you and deepening that revelation and deepening your understanding of the gospel so that from that place, it's not performance, it's just a response to his love. Verse 15 says, No longer do I call you servants. The servant does not know what his master is doing. I've called you friends. All that I've heard from the Father, I've made known to you. My Father. The implication, I think the rather... The assumption within this is that there is a need to seek the will of God. Jesus is revealing. Jesus is teaching. Jesus has more to show us as his people. But there is a degree of seeking that is required on my part. Jesus says, if you ask, seek, knock, sweet, you'll get, you'll receive, the door will be open. It'll be great. But James tells us, ask with faith and according to the will of God, First John says. So I should seek the will of God in every moment. What does it mean to be a friend of God? It means I don't assume that my understanding is always correct. So I have to lean on someone who has perfect understanding all the time. Which means I need to seek his will and guidance and direction and clarity. And and I need him to really show me what it means in this moment to really do his will. So seek his will. Don't be prideful and lean on your own understanding. But in all of your ways, not some of them, not most of them, in all of your decisions, from the smallest to the biggest, You don't always have time to flip through the scriptures and do an exhaustive study on like marriage and divorce. Sometimes, what what does the scripture say about this? What do I know God says about this? And when when it's still unclear, God, I'm, I'm here to seek you. Please reveal to me what it is I'm to do or what it is I'm to bring to the table here. But the assumption is like Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says that we don't always see things correctly. My understanding is not always reliable. It's flawed. Verse 16, you didn't choose me. I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. So what is it that Jesus, well, if you go back to John 15, I think it's verse 8, by this my Father is glorified that you bear fruit and prove to be my disciples. What is it that God desires of his people? Well, he desires fruit. And if we're going to define that properly, go to Galatians 5. The fruit of the Spirit is Love, joy, peace, you know, go down the list. But it's Jesus who produces good fruit through his people when we abide. And so I think friendship with God, I wanted to say receive God's love, obey his word, seek his will, bear good fruit. But I want to take the bear good fruit away. Because my responsibility is not fruit. If you read John 15, our responsibility is to abide, stay close, remain, sit under his love, position ourselves in proximity to the Father where he can minister to us and fill us and teach us. Do that. Walk in his ways. Submit to his spirit. And good fruit will begin to flow through through your life. As the seed of God's word is planted, he bears the fruit. He gets the glory. But you are a part of that. You're a part of that. The fifth thing, what it looks like to live in friendship with God, is to Really ask your father. Philippians 4 will tell us, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, petition God. Everything, everything, everything. And I think he really means in all things, petition God and let your requests be made known to him. Because Jesus says right here, go and bear fruit so that. 
when your fruit's abiding and you're fruitful and you're following Jesus, that's a condition. That's a prerequisite. And when that's true, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. That's the result. You want to see prayers answered. You want to see the will of God done in your life. You want to see like things happening through you and in you and around you that you can't explain and God is the only explanation for that kind of miraculous power. You want to begin praying according to the will of God in your life for your community, for your kids, for your job, for your, for your co-workers. Be already doing what you know to do. It is easier to pray His will and to know His will when you're already living out His will. If you're doing nothing with what he's already taught you, then I would say you're not really set up for success when it comes to your prayer life. Because you're just, you're choosing to do nothing with what he's already revealed to you. Why would he reveal more to you that you're just going to be faithless with? So it's more likely that I'm praying his will when I'm already living his will. So ask your father. There's an invitation to boldly approach the throne of grace and let our requests be made known to God, to ask Him, to petition, to bring God into what I'm doing. Not that He isn't involved, but to almost make myself aware that He's present, He's involved. I've asked for His will to be done, and I'm confident He'll do it. So friendship with God looks like receive God's love, obey His word, seek His will, bear, not bear good fruit, but abide in Him. Ask your Father for whatever is on your heart, like Psalm says. Delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart. And the last thing is this, verse 17, love like Jesus. Love like Jesus. Verse 12 tells us, love others, that's the commandment. That's the sum total of the commandments, love God and love people. But the example and the motivation is the love God has first shown us. So Jesus is inviting us to lay down our life for others because we're so secure in him and what he's done for us. If he laid down for his life for me, then it should be a domino effect and it should cause me to lay down my life for others. And when that bears good fruit in the lives of others, they will lay their lives down for others and it just becomes a domino effect of hey everyone's cared for everyone's loved everyone's secure everyone's trusting in the love God has for them and this is what I want to end with when you go to John, uh, Luke 7 33 through 35 Jesus is accused as being a friend of tax collectors and sinners same with Luke 15 1 through 2 this man receives sinners and eats with them and I promise you I promise you When you are receiving God's love daily, which will produce an obedience to his word and a seeking of his will, and you're bearing good fruit by abiding, and you're asking your father for his will to be done in your life, and your prayer life is thriving, and you're loving like Jesus, when you're walking in friendship with God, you will be accused of things that are completely off and completely wrong. The, the accusation really from the Pharisees is Jesus is approving of the sinful lives, uh, lifestyles of the people he's eating with. No, he's interacting with them to confront them lovingly in what they're doing, and they are changing their minds. They are repenting. They are, belie- they are turning back to God and returning to his law and his commands in that sense of the old covenant work. They're, they're returning to God because Jesus, has not, he's not coming to coddle them in their sin. He's coming to call them out of their sin. Just by their interaction with Jesus, there is a conviction and a change that is prompted. So guess what? People will accuse you of all kinds of false things. All who desire to live a, a life of godliness will be persecuted. You'll be called things that aren't true. You'll be labeled things that are way off. You'll be accused of doing things and saying things that, have, that are nowhere close to what you're actually doing and saying. And your job is just to daily, this rhythm of friendship. I should have titled this serv- sermon the, the Rhythm of Friendship. There is a rhythm to this. It's I'm positioning myself in His love, abiding, 
letting him fill me to obey and I'm seeking his will, asking him for things and love is flowing out of my life the way Jesus laid down his life. Friendship with God is not something to take advantage of. It's actually something to share with others and invite them into. Hey, I, they, usually we the first thing you talk about when people meet you is what you're most excited about, what most has your heart, what has the most weight in your life. It's typically one of the first things you'll talk about. Is it your job? Is it your family? Is it your achievements? Is, is it where you live? Is it what you've done? Or is it what Jesus has done for you? This is what it means to live as friends of God. Hey, don't forget to like this video and subscribe for more biblical content just like this. We have hundreds of videos, but you might be most interested in these ones right here. Also, visit our website for all of our free resources and classes. And thank you so much for partnering with us financially to make this ministry even possible. Keep moving towards Jesus, and I'll see you in the next video.